I will I will give an, uh, an overview of, of OBIS, the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, what it is. Uh, so I'm the I'm the the head of the of the international OBIS here in the, in our stand. So our our vision and our mission, which we defined uh, a few months ago uh, in the steering group uh, meeting, is that OBIS aims to build the most comprehensive gateway to the world's ocean biodiversity and biogeographic data and information that is required to address pressing coastal and world ocean concerns. That's our vision. And our mission is, is we will achieve this by building and maintaining a global alliance that collaborates with scientific communities to facilitate free and open access to an application of biodiversity and biogeographic data and information on marine life. So we, we added actually biodiversity in our mission and, and uh, vision statement uh, as complementary to just biogeographic data. It started in, to, in the years 2000, well actually just before uh, the uh, that was uh, uh, built by the census of marine life where the idea was well we should start to document what lived what lives and what will live in the oceans today and the the census of marine life started in 2000 was funded mainly by the uh, the Alfred Sloan Foundation in the United States it was a it was a, one of the the biggest uh, initiatives uh, uniting, well, almost 3,000 scientists all over the world from 18 nations. They list 540 expeditions, uh, 2,600 scientific publications. They discovered potentially 6,000 new species. 30 million distribution records uh, were uploaded into OBIS. And it all costed 650 million US dollars by direct and associated funding. And from the very beginning, OBIS was identified as the data repository, the information component of the census of marine life. <coughs> um, but it was very clear, Sloan Foundation made it very, very clear from the beginning that we will fund the census of marine life for 10 years and not, and, and not longer. So then it should be uh, merged into something else. Uh, so for OBIS, the whole data legacy uh, that, that was established by the Sense of Marine Life had to find a new home. And at, uh, at the 25th session of the IUC assembly, where all the IUC member states gather, uh, and that was in June 2009, the IUC assembly decided to adopt OBIS as part of IUDE <coughs> for uh, four main reasons. Was it uh, is of such importance to national and global environmental issues that the responsibility for its continuing success should be assumed by governments. Um, well, IOC member states have identified uh, before the need to acquire ocean biogeographic data. Uh, also, in the UN General Assembly, uh, there is a statement that uh, in one of the ocean resolutions that says that without accurate, repeatable, and timely biological data, it is impossible to address adequately global ocean environmental issues. And OBIS provided that opportunity to adopt an existing global network of uh, practitioners and, and, and data and to attract the associated research com community. <coughs> so at this moment, we have, uh, well, we had 30 million at the end of the Sense in Real Life. We are now at 30 8 million distribution records, but 115,000 marine species. Uh, Lynn mentioned we, we estimate there is 230,000 described already. Well, uh, about half of them are in OBIS. We have integrated more than 1,400 data sets from 450 data providers in 56 countries. So it's, it's really, it's, it's one of the largest, uh, well, it is the largest, world largest database on the distribution of an abundance of species, marine species. Here is uh, a map of, uh, a global map, where we uh, aggregate all uh, observations within uh, a five, uh, five by five degree cell. And there you could see that we have the most data from uh, from 
northern Europe, from uh, the east coast of uh, states, but also from South Africa, uh, Peru, uh, a little bit of uh, Australia. But if you if you aggregate it in one by one degree cell, if you get, go to a finer resolution, you will see that there are a lot, quite a lot of uh, uh, places where we don't have any data. So mainly the South Pacific, the South Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean. There are places where we haven't sampled or collected data from. If you if you get a, if I provide you with an Arctic view, uh, again by five degree and by one degree, you can see in the Arctic uh, it's nearly empty uh, of species distribution records. Same for the uh, Pacific view. Still many places where we don't have data. Uh, we also have very few historical data. It only started uh, expanding from the 1960s. And in fact, there are only 100 marine species for which we have a yearly record between 1955 and 2005. Uh, if you want to know if a species is extinct, we usually say, well, we don't have observed it anymore in the last 50 years. Well, we don't have a lot of data if you, if you go back 50 years. So it's uh, therefore it's so difficult to, uh, to know if a marine species is is extinct or not. Uh, here I we plotted uh, the, num the maximum observations per taxonomic group and you can see that there are groups where the maximum number of observations that we have per year of that species within that taxonomic group uh, were in the 1910, some in, in 1970, and um, almost everything before 2000. So even beyond Beyond 2000, we don't have so much data in, in OBIS for many taxonomic groups. Uh, also, in, in the deep sea and far offshore, uh, there are not so many uh, records in, in OBIS. You could, here, this is a, actually a, a 3D graph that we plotted on a 2D dimension. So every cell is a, a 3.5 million uh, uh, cube kilometer in, in volume where we calculated the number of records that we have so you could see that in the continental shelf we have the most records and also in the, in the at the surface we have most records but if you go very deep and very much offshore we almost have uh, we have very very little data we, so we did that it was published by Tom Webb and, uh, and colleagues in, in PLOS One. It was published in 2009, and we did the same exercise with Tom in 2013 database. And you could see that we are, but, okay, slowly, but we are filling the gaps towards uh, uh, more records in open ocean and deep sea. Uh, here is a graph. You can also you can all see this on, on the OBIS website. This is a global map on the number of species in OBIS aggregated by a 5x5 five five degree cell. And there you can see that, well, most species are along the coasts uh, and also lots of species uh, reported in the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, that's, that's of course because we have lots of, lots of observations in that area. But if you then uh, do the, the ES50, is the, the Hulbert uh, index, which is the the ex ex uh, expected number of species in a random sample of 50 specimens. So if you take f 50 specimens in the ocean and you count the, sp the species, uh, well, if you everything that's red means that in that bucket of 50 specimens, you, you can expect 38 different species. And then you can see that uh, <coughs> most biodiversity is, uh, well, if you, if you, if I do this, you will see that there's less diversity, expected diversity in, in the Northeast Atlantic, but more in the tropical and coastal areas. Uh, here, I already told you we are still growing in number of records. Now we have 38 million records. Uh, also number of data sets. We have more, of, more than 1,400 data sets. Uh, 
growing in terms of observations is, uh, is becoming more and more difficult because the average size of a data sets is decreasing. In the very beginning, we had, well, well we, we, we picked the, the low-hanging fruits, uh, the large data sets, but now every data set on average is between 20 and 40, well, let's say 25,000 records on average. That's, that's the average data set size. We're also adding new species. The last harvest that we did uh, uh, a few months ago at 900 new species that were previously not in Obis. So here, well, it's uh, we're still adding about 1,000 uh, species per year. Um, and he, but here is a graph on the total number of species in Obis. And you, could, you can clearly see that there we are reaching an asymptote but actually we are sometimes even decreasing. We once had uh, 100, uh, 130,000 species, but now we have 115,000 species. That is because we are in increasing the quality of, of the data. We are matching with the World Register of Marine Species and we discover that two names in Obis are actually just one species. So we have to we synonymize, synonymize them. But this, um, yeah. And here's a graph on the number of records and the number of species so we per year so we we collect about um, 1 million observations per year and uh, between 10,000 and 12,000 marine species are observed every year but how is how does this if you put everything in perspective what does this represent um, when, when I was working with Lane at FLIS and the World Rights of Marine Species, well, we with all the taxonomic experts, we published a paper on the, uh, and we asked every taxonomic expert for its particular taxonomic group, what, what are the number of species that are known? What are the number of species that you think are already collected but residing in museum collections and are not described yet? How many species do you expect uh, that are not discovered yet? In the ocean, and how many species do you think can be will be created new on the basis of DNA sequencing? And then we came up with if we collected all that information by 120 different taxonomic experts, we we came up with a figure between 700,000 and 1 million marine species in total. So there are this today 230,000 that are described. We have about 120, 115,000 in, in Obis. We observe 12,000 species per year. And uh, if, to give you a figure, the IUCN, uh, well, the International Union Cons Conservation of Nature, they, they do an assessment. They produce that red list of species. They, as they do assessments of, st of species. Well, they, there are 5,400 marine species that have an, an assessment. So we know actually a, a very small fraction of total biodiversity in the ocean. So it's, it's, it's really a, a challenge to say like what, what is the status of, of marine biodiversity today if we only have uh, an assessment of uh, well less than 1% and if we only observe 12,000 species per year. So one th third of one fourth of the marine species are known today and two-thirds of the known marine species have less than three observations. That's also important, I didn't mention. So only 5% of the known species diversity is, is observed every year. Most of the data that we have are from the large vertebrates, fish, birds, and mammals, mostly from the northern hemisphere, which are the least biodiversity-rich areas. Most data from coastal areas, and we have very little historical data. This is uh, the, in the International Secretariat is based here in, in Ostend. So uh, myself and, and Mike, who introduced himself uh, this morning, uh, the, the, the project office is headed by Peter Persiersens, and here are the colleagues that we uh, that form the team here in Ostend. But we are, of course, we are not doing all this work on, on our own. So we have local support, but we also have support from 
from VLIS, from the Flanders Marine Institute, who are also the European Obus node on the worms. We have uh, support from Duke University. They are providing, they are helping us with uh, the, the Obus portal and geospatial analysis tools. And Simon Bolivar University in Venezuela, they built the website. So everything uh, that is uh, red is uh, organized here in, in Ostend, and everything is blue is are the, the other nodes. So we have the International Obus node, uh, the Secretariat, and we have the, the SG, the steering group of Obus, the GE, the group of experts, and we are the International Obus node. The SG steering group is uh, several task teams, at the moment eight task teams. We have designed the advisory task team, the taxonomy task team, the training task team, data content task team, technical task team. Um, and then you have the, the OBUS nodes. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, a tier three architecture where we have level, level three nodes connecting the data providers. Uh, uh, we have the tier two nodes who are connecting the three tier nodes, getting the data. For, to give you an example, the, the Black Sea OBUS node and the Mediterranean OBUS node are the three, uh, tier three nodes. They are harvested by the European node, and, and we, the, we are node one here in Ostend, and we are harvesting the, the European node. So it's possible that in the future, uh, well, there's something we have to discuss uh, and, and see how we can proceed, but it's possible that Afrobus becomes a tier two node and that there are several nodes in Africa, a tier three node, uh, or, an, 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 or we can have an, another kind of model. But uh, these are possibilities. Every, every level has, uh, has, has an increasing responsibility and tasks. The, 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 the tier two Obus node should provide information uh, completely quality controlled that we just have to harvest and, and, and that we can process and put on the internet. While a tier three node uh, will do less quality control tools on, on their data. So in the cases where a tier three node does not have a tier two node, we, because it is in red, we perform the, uh, the activities of, of the tier two node here in Ostend. So at this moment we have 20 OBUS nodes, well, oh sorry, 25 OBUS nodes. Um, those in black are also the National Oceanographic Data Centers. But as you can see, there are many uh, that are not part of the NODC. Uh, so we have regional OBUS, regional nodes like, uh, like Antarctic, European uh, nodes, but you also have national OBUS nodes. Um, well, the Afrobus is, is, a, is clearly a regional node. And in blue are the global thematic nodes. We also have a number of nodes that are based on the particular taxonomic group, but cover the entire globe, like the microbes node for the microbes and the protests. OBC map is the, the thematic node for mega vertebrates, like seabirds, marine mammals, and turtles, like corals, fish base, and sea mounts. We recently added two new nodes, which is Pigo Obis, the, which is the, uh, the Persian uh, Gulf and the Gulf of Oman node, which is hosted by at the NODC of Iran. And a new node is the Southeast Pacific. Oh, no, sorry. Um, the Philippines, the Sea Obis, is the Southeast Asia Obis node. All the, the ASEAN countries uh, are united by the Asian Center of Biodiversity. And in Venezuela, we, will, we are setting up a Caribbean OBIS node. So what kind of data do we have in OBIS? We have species name and classification, the position, which can be a single point, it can be a bounding box or a transit line. We have the, when the species was observed, how many individuals or biomass, the depth support, and also which cruise was it, what was the sampling gear? Do you have any an, uh, oceanographic data um, and the metadata on the data set? So who, what, where, when, and how was the data collected? And if we want to use a data set, how should it be cited? 
We have data from scientific cruises, small-scale research projects, but also national monitoring data. Sometimes they are continuous observations, like the CPR, continuous plankton recorder, uh, the Cal Coffee, uh, Cal uh, Californian uh, uh, monitoring program on fish, scientific literature, literature, museum collections, all kinds of data are integrated in all this. We are now uh, getting uh, more and more different types of, of data with new technologies that are uh, emerging. So we have, uh, instead of just taking a grab or, 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 or fishing um, uh, species, we now have more and more observations based on ship or, or uh, or planes, there is uh, tracking. The species are tagged, and they are uh, and they are tracked by satellites. Uh, we have acoustic data. The species are now tagged. They send uh, a ping, and the boys are 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 um, are getting the 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 ping of the of the tag. Um, there are colonies and sites of observations for turtles, for example. There are forecasting models, photo ID identifications of, of whales. So we are we're getting multiple types of, of, of data now that we have to support. And the OBC map is, is, is leading that in, in terms of uh, different kinds of data, of course, for marine mammals uh, and, and birds and turtles. Sometimes uh, easier to observe them through satellites or, or airplanes or, or and tagging them. Well, here's another kind of, if you go to the OBC map website, there you can see survey tracks and uh, all of species. And so in, in the OBS portal, we also integrate species observations with data from the World Ocean Atlas, the uh, observations such as bottom depth, temperature, salinity, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphate, silicate. Uh, you can create time series and, and histograms, but I will show you uh, in a later presentation, how you can uh, access data through the OBS portal. But you can map, for example, all the cetacean species observed in a particular LME region, but you can also limit that. For example, give me all the <coughs> marine mammals uh, in the range between 13 and 15 degrees Celsius temperature range. So you can, you can select and filter uh, on the OBS portal. Uh, here is an example of uh, the species richness uh, per marine protected area in the United States. Uh, a species checklist you can produce uh, for your region. Uh, invasive species, uh, you can try to detect uh, distribution of invasive species like the lionfish is a very nice example in the, which it, the light, there were a number of lionfish that, that lived in an aquarium in Miami. They escaped and in, I think it was in 96 or 97, uh, they escaped in Miami. So we had a few observations in, uh, well, before 2000, here close to Florida. And now it's completely widespread in the, Car in the Caribbean Sea. Um, and it's very, it's a very pest because it, it eats all, all other fish species. Uh, species modeling, uh, you, you probably, well, you may have heard of uh, aquamaps, uh, which is uh, an, creates a species envelope uh, model. What the, the range, the temperature range, the salinity range, the depth range uh, of a species, and and models that in terms of uh, climate change models. So we have the species observations from OBIS. There is the native range model at, uh, of that species based on the environmental parameters. Well, in 2050, it predicts the range of that of that fish species. So if you if you look uh, what the the changing colors, so red is high abundance. So that species, for example, will disappear from the tropical area uh, according to the the climate change uh, predictions already in 2050. So that's not so far away anymore. Uh, OBIS is also a very important tool for area-based management. Uh, one of the HE biodiversity targets, uh, HE uh, targets were defined by the Convention on Bi Biological Diversity in 2010, I think it was. <coughs> and they are, there are 20 targets they want to reach by 2020, and one of them is target 11, is that 10% of the coastal and marine areas 
needs to be conserved or managed in a sustainable way by 2020. And there are a number of processes to define areas that are important for protection uh, or sustainable management. So you have the EPSAS, the ecologically or biologically significant areas, a process by the CBD. You have a process by F FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, which are who are defining the vulnerable marine ecosystems, particularly in the deep sea and the seabed areas. You have the uh, PSSAs uh, by IMO, the International Maritime Organization, who is responsible for ship traffic. <laughs> they are defining what the particular sensitive sea areas. Uh, if there is a ship accident or a, a oil spills, uh, where are the areas that are most vulnerable uh, and uh, what, what can have the most impact on local biodiversity if that accident happens. You have national parks, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, UNESCO Biosphere, so name it. Every international organization today have its own process in identifying important areas and are used most of them are using data from OBIS. A few slides on the EPSA process. There are seven criteria to define uh, a potential EPSA. And four of them is what uh, are... Uh, are uh, in, to four of them, OBIS contributes, which is areas of high biodiversity, areas of special importance for the life history of species, uh, significant naturalness and uniqueness or rarity. These are four criteria that we support. This is the, the map. The dark blue areas are the currently proposed EPSAs. And, uh, and they are organizing regional workshops. And I just uh, sup superimposed a, a map that we produced for, uh, for the workshop in Brazil. These are the, the dots are the data from uh, from OBIS, and actually, the the area here in, in Brazil is is an EPSA and was almost entirely based on data from OBIS. <coughs> so what we do in OBIS, we don't do in our own. We try to collaborate and and and, and contribute to many others like the FAO, uh, IPBES. You probably heard about the IPBES, the uh, inter. Uh, Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, GEO, Group on Earth Observations, the Law of the Sea, and, and GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Uh, another uh, map, things that we, we try to do uh, working together with ESA, is the International Seabed Authority. They, we have the, the deep sea observations in OBIS, on the right, you have the the, the sites that are uh, explored and, and and mined, and well, where ESA is giving licenses to to do mining. So if we integrate that information, you can actually see if an area that has been mined or or uh, or use of if there are human activities, what is the richness of that area, and uh, if is that changing through time something we are trying to explore together with ESA. Also in the, in the, in the light of the future uh, uh, instrument that will be part of uh, the law of the sea, the, at this moment there is a, a UN working group preparing uh, a new uh, legal instrument to protect uh, and study marine biodiversity in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and that will be because Everything that is in the open ocean, the nations uh, are not, they don't have, th th there is no law that, that tells you, well, you can, uh, you can do mining or, or, you, or you can uh, do, uh, take away m marine spon sponges because sponges has a lot of com bioactive components for, uh, for making anti-drug cancer, uh, uh, anti-cancer drugs, things like that. So there's there's no law that regulates that mining of biodiversity in, in the open ocean. And now there's a process, uh, and it, it will be uh, proposed uh, in 2015 uh, to the general uh, to the United Nations General Assembly. And the effort, the the, the G77 and and China. So 
all the, well all the developing countries uh, they consider biodiversity as as the common goods in uh, in the open ocean which means that uh, everyone that that have that has benefits from these ex exploitations should share that with with, with the nations and, and the world so it's not that because the rich countries that have large vessels and can do mining in very deep oceans should get all the profit. It's uh, the biodiversity in open ocean. We should we should manage it and we should preserve it. But we should we can harvest it and we can exploit it, but in a way that we all share the benefits of it, and not just those that are rich. So that's a, that's a very important uh, concept. Uh, but of course, we can only protect or. Uh, uh, or conserve something if if we if we measure it and if we know about it. Another another benefit sharing uh, <coughs> example in with with Obis is uh, these are the number of records that we have for each country in Obis. Everything that is green was provided to us by the National Obis Node, and everything that's red is what uh, Obis uh, has for their within their national EEZ. So there's always data uh, that comes f that is not in a national repository, but uh, was, it was part of an international project. But the data of that international project was uh, is, is kept somewhere else. And thanks to an international uh, initiative like OBIS, a country can get more data from its own EEZ than what the national data center has. Obis. So if you all start sharing information, you will you will have a benefit and get more information about your country. So this is a graph on the number of records, and this is a graph on the number of species that we know of exist in your EEZ. So we know more, more species in your EEZ than the National Obus Node has. This is my last slide. It's probably not so easy to see because of the, the light colors. But it shows the, the web statistics of the OBIS portal. And uh, we still have to do some outreach in, in Africa because there are almost no visitors from the African countries except from South Africa and maybe here, not the Northern African countries. So it looks like uh, you, you will all, when you go home, please tell people about the OBIS and the OBIS website so that I can, I can see that there are people visiting i uh, visiting our website from africa sorry yeah that's very strange and i still have to find out but that's uh, uh, that's turkey so i can't understand but someone in turkey is uh, is, is really exploiting our website and our database <laughs>